Hi, so it's Allison here. I am in the lab with KT. KT, say hi. Hello. Hello. And we are going to be showing you how to do mini preps today. Um, so a quick background, mini preps are how we remove DNA from the bacteria that we have cultured and transformed. Um, so then we can use that DNA to do further experiments later on. So currently we have transformed bacteria, which means that we have inserted the DNA that we designed or desire into bacteria. And the bacteria have produced a lot of it for us as it grows. Um, and then we're just in the process of mini prepping, AKA harvesting these DNA plasmids. All right, so follow us on our journey. All right, Katie, so what is the first step that we're going to okay, do? Okay, so first, this is our inoculated bacteria. And as you can see, it's a pretty cloudy mixture. So it's Luria broth or LB with, um, you know, our DNA. Is it focusing? Yeah. Okay, okay. nice. But basically, what we want to do is just get the cells out without all the extra liquid. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to centrifuge it. It might get a little loud. It's okay. Unsure. But essentially, the way centrifuging works is it spins the, um, the tubes around very, very quickly and forces all the solids to sediment at the bottom in a compact pellet while all the liquid stays above. And then we can just aspirate or take out the liquid and leave the cell pelleted at the bottom. Okay. Oh, right. So centrifuges, you always have to be very careful about making sure that they're balanced because they rotate at such a high speed that, you know, any slight lack of balance can really mess them up. So um, I'm not exactly the greatest authority on this matter, but according to Justin, our PI, um, as long as you kind of align them and make sure everything looks like symmetrical. So, I'm gonna press it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna do 40 to 20 G, and we're gonna do it for six minutes. So, this G versus RPM switch. RPM is, I think, just rotations per minute. And the issue with this um, metric is that it varies from machine to machine. Whereas the G metric is a standardized measurement that will stay the same across every machine. So, it's usually preferable to use numbers like this in protocols because that we can replicate. Um, across various machines. So we're just going to keep it go. Keep it for six minutes at room temperature. And then it just speeds up because it's okay. Thank Woo! you, Katie. Yes, of course. We are done centrifuging the cells, so we're going to pop it open. And then, ta da! Would you like to do the honors? But you can see the pellet right there, and those are all of the cells. And then this liquid is now clear, which indicates that there are no cells in there. The whole point of centrifuging, right, was to pellet out the cells at the bottom. So we're going to basically aspirate the liquid on top, and then we're going to resuspend it in a little bit of buffer with RNase. So RNase is an enzyme that will basically degrade all the RNA in the sample. And that's important because we don't want any contamination. We just want pure DNA plasma at the end. So getting rid of everything step by step is really important. So, aspiration. When we aspirate, we want to make sure that we do not accidentally aspirate up the pellet as well. So that is one. That's one. Another one. So essentially we have this buffer. And it comes just as this buffer P1, which is just like a resuspension buffer. Sorry. And then we add RNase A into it, and we also add something called lice blue, which is just a really cool color indicator that turns blue and ensures that you know that you're doing everything correctly. So right. what we're gonna do is we're gonna resuspend the pellets in here. Resuspend just means rather than have like the cells pelleted as a solid, they're in a um, liquid mixture. And then we're gonna pipette them into these small microcentrifuge tubes. It's just an empty tube, <laughs> but yeah. Um, and the reason we do that is because we're gonna have multiple centrifugation steps after this, so we need these small tubes. And there's just no point in having such a large tube for a small amount of liquid. Agreed. Do you? All right. Okay, so we can see the pilot at the bottom, and then we're going to resuspend 
the pellet and you can see that the solution is getting cloudy. It's because all of the bacteria are being resuspended into the buffer and RNA ACE A solution. I'll probably just cut and then we'll come back yeah. when we're done with this. Okay, because we do many preps a lot, just like supplement it later. Mm -hmm. You're doing 250, right? Yeah. What's the step that Matt said to not pipette up and down because we might shear the DNA? Um, I think just like the lice, once it's been lysed, mm -hmm. you don't want to because, yeah. So okay. like, for example, like the white, like when it precipitates out, don't do it. Probably to be safe, don't do it in like the blue part. Like whenever mm -hmm. it says invert, just like invert. Invert it. Okay. Here, wait, I'll pause it for now. It's okay. Mm -hmm. This is going to lyse the cells. Lyse means to break. So after this step, the cells are going to be broken and um, we are going to be able to access the cellular components after the membrane has been broken. All right. When you use the pipettes, it's good to like kind of go a little bit slowly so that you don't get bubbles and um, make sure you have the proper quantities that you want. Put it in. And then you'll see that the solution immediately turns blue. So it's maybe on the black glove, definitely not on. But uh, it's so pretty. And again, that's because we have the lice blue in the P1 buffer. And that's how we know that the step is going well and it's actually mixed up. And then we just keep doing that. And the reason, um, in general, when you're mini prepping, it's good to invert rather than to like pipette up and down, which is a standard way to mix things, is because we're working with genomic DNA and we want pure genomic, no, we want plasmas at the end, and we don't want like all kinds of cell debris and that kind of thing. So if you pipette up and down, then you can introduce shearing forces that can basically cause all kinds of things to get broken up and cause contamination of your final product. So instead we just gently invert because that's obviously a lot more gentle and less likely, I guess, to introduce contamination by breaking things up. It's still possible. Are you gonna invert also? Yeah, I'll invert. Okay, so we immediately close and invert it. This. And we invert it immediately because we don't want localized precipitation. So we don't want the buffer to just, for example, precipitate the very top of the mixture. We wanna make sure it gets through everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello. So the centrifuge run is finally done. So we can take our tubes out and you can see, sorry, you can see. So on this side, we have a very nice white pellet, what we want to avoid. So we're going to try to pipette out the liquid without touching the pellet at all. And that's important because the more of the pellet we get into our liquid after this, the more contaminated our result is, which is bad, obviously. So... Let's just take these out. See, it's just like, it's unfortunate because it's not as compact as ideal. Not like because it's our fault, like that's just how it is. But it makes pipetting a little bit difficult. But we will do our best. Yee. So we want to pipette out 800 microliters of the fluid or the supernatant is what it's called. And then we will put them into these these like spin filter tubes so okay these are actually kind of fun so basically we have these and these are just part of the mini prep kit they're not like normal things I guess but there are two components so there's the actual filter and the little white part is the filter which catches the DNA so that's where the DNA plasmids bind and then this like normal tube that's where the flow through or the liquid containing all the 
extraneous parts that we don't want, that's where it collects, and then we can just keep throwing that away. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now this is actually, like, for me, the most stressful part. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I think this is where, like, the 260, 230 errors come from. What do you mean, 260, 230? Like, when you nano drop, you know how oh. sometimes it'll say, like, salts are left over? I think that's... If there are salts, it's not necessarily because, like, you pipetted wrong or anything, right? I think, yeah. I think also, like, the wash buffer sometimes is just goofy. Mm -hmm. um, Go centrifuge these again for 60 seconds so the float, so the supernatant will be pushed through the filter into the tube. Yeah, and in this step also the DNA binds to the filter so it just stays there and stays put until the very end. Yes. Right. It's the usual 17900G for a minute and this will just allow the buffer to wash through the filter and get rid of any contamination. Here I'm just I am discarding the flow through and then putting them into these micro centrifuge Eppendorf tubes. Beautiful. Hey. All right. Okay. Now for our final centrifuge step. So here you also have to be a little bit careful because we have these open centrifuge tubes and when you are centrifuging open tubes like this you want to make sure that the caps first of all are inside otherwise the lid won't close but also you want to make sure that they're kind of tailing behind the direction that the centrifuge spins and you can tell because there's an arrow here so you know that it's always going to keep going this way and this prevents the caps from just snapping off during the actual centrifuging which is not like horrible but then you have to like get a new tube which no I'll just talk but basically so um the way that this works is it measures absorbance at different wavelengths of light and so um if you can I do a blank between that like I'm a little you can if you want yeah you're not sure go ahead um what was I saying right so basically you can measure the absorbance at each wavelength and that's what the curve gives you and then you can also calculate ratios of absorbance at different wavelengths. And what that does is it gives you a rough estimate of how pure your sample is because different types of um, macromolecules will absorb light at different wavelengths. So for example, I think DNA will absorb at 260 nanometers, whereas things like salts and proteins will absorb at 230 and 280 nanometers. And by calculating the ratios and kind of comparing them to the, I guess like, scientific standard ranges for purity you can determine if there's too much protein or more protein than you'd expect contaminating your sample or if there's more salts than you expect contaminating your sample um, that's really good